Uh, well, thanks everybody for joining, um, and uh, and welcome to uh, to my talk in this new format. Uh, big thanks to the folks uh, who directed Apache Con, put this event together. Uh, I know personally how hard it is to arrange uh, a virtual event, kind of in this format, this new format that we're all working with. So, big thanks there. Um, I'm Justin Riach, Chief Architect uh, at Open Logic by uh, Perforce. Uh, and I've been in this uh, industry doing various work around free software, uh, everything from enterprise solution implementation to more evangelism, public speaking, this kind of thing. And uh, these technologies in particular, uh, Camel and some of the related middleware, uh, are kind of near and dear projects that I've been close to for a while and have done uh, a lot of implement implementations on. Uh, our company does this type of work, support and services for a number of different companies. Uh, if you want more information on that, uh, we do have a booth uh, here. You can check us out at the booth. Uh, we're also on at hashtag open logic in the Slack. Uh, there's related talk for this talk going on in hashtag camel, I think. Um, and we are offering 10% off of our ActiveMQ training as part of this. And that is, I promise, the very last sales pitch you will get from me. So what is it? about enterprise integration patterns and what is it about message-oriented middleware that we're using to solve business problems? Well, let's do kind of a quick exercise to kind of get your brain uh, in shape for the rest of this presentation. I'm gonna show you three slides. All right, all three of these slides are gonna have one thing in common. I want you to see if you can figure out what it is. So the first one is the chupacabra. All right, the chupacabra. The second one, is a magical unicorn, all right? A magical unicorn. We've got a chupacabra, a magical unicorn. The third one is a fully homogenous enterprise landscape where every bit of the landscape uses the exact same architecture and the exact same backing language and the exact same database and the exact same everything in all of the various silos of the business, all right? So chupacabra, unicorn, homogenous enterprise landscape. What do we think? Well, none of these things exist in real life, all right? I think we can all kind of agree uh, that that's what they all have in common. All right, so with that, with that lack of uniformity in these systems that we're trying to federate um, in the enterprise, we've got some solutions. We have familiar problems and we have a number of uh, fairly expensive solutions. Um, what are these solutions all kind of revolve around? Well, this notion of traditional messaging middleware. All right, so I think it's fair then to say that our applications often have a need to be able to send information back and forth to one another, right, in a fairly normalized fashion. And believe it or not, this was not always easy to do. Um, back in the old days, uh, when uh, systems were a bit more monolithic and we didn't have great uh, uh, solutions like, uh, like Apache Camel uh, to give us good asynchronous messaging patterns, it was often hard to federate applications uh, with one another. And of course, as businesses became more software focused and business infrastructure became more uh, software driven and data driven, you know, the need to federate applications after something like a major acquisition uh, or maybe you know, picking up uh, some, some new technology set that isn't necessarily interoperable with other technologies became more and more of a problem, right? And you know, on, the, on the one hand, I'm a business, I'm an enterprise, I go and acquire some company and all of a sudden I have these new systems to deal with maybe a lot of bespoke applications and, and things like that, you know, I could re-implement those applications according to my internal best practices, but we all know that that would be expensive and you end up really with, you know, not a whole lot of payoff. Uh, it makes a lot more sense to federate where we can or I'll just, just, just to uh, attach these systems. So this isn't a new problem and things like JMS uh, evolved out of a need to be able to federate systems that are very different uh, than one another with one another. So uh, one of the most recognizable solutions uh, that we saw for the problem of, het of heterogeneous systems uh, integrating with one another is this pattern of an enterprise service bus or an ESB, right? Which is just a design pattern. It's an architectural design pattern that focuses on federation um, using a common kind of runtime or a common framework to uh, connect systems uh, to one another. Uh, ideally, this service bus pattern is gonna provide a series of loosely coupled endpoints. 
and then our various heterogeneous systems are going to be able to communicate with one another you know via whatever native language native client uh, native protocol makes sense for that app so maybe i've got a a .NET or a SOAP-driven app, um, and, and I should be able to send data along the bus, but I want that to be able to be received by like a JMS destination. Um, that ESB is gonna be able to provide that payload, protocol normalization, all that stuff to facilitate that communication, and hopefully I have loose coupling with this ESB, uh, and I can remain, you know, I don't, I don't care what's going on behind any of these endpoints, right? And again, this is not new tech, this is not a new pattern, right? This was just, uh, kind of the most central enterprise pattern in enterprise uh, architecture and enterprise integration that arose to kind of deal with this problem of federating systems, all right? So in general, an ESB should provide pretty much all of these things, uh, the ability to bind to certain protocols and the ability to bind uh, data and pass data along a wire. So the ability to, to transport, right? Uh, the ability to transform data route data intelligently based maybe on some, uh, uh, some, some kind of characteristic of that data. Uh, I should be able to mediate across platforms. In, in other words, I should have no problems plugging uh, common and, and well-understood uh, pro uh, applications programmed in well-understood programming languages or created in well-understood frameworks. I should be able to plug them all into the same ESB and have them communicate with one another. They should have something native uh, for their language or framework, a client that allows me to communicate across this, this bus. Uh, there's probably gonna be messaging, right? I mean, most of the time, the data itself that we're shuttling through uh, this bus is gonna take the form of, of like a payload driven type of data. Hopefully we're orchestrating and we're not just sending things around. Uh, so there's gonna be some coordination to how we orchestrate the processes. QoS is always a good thing so that we can make sure that we're doing all of our good guarantee delivery. We're not losing messages, we're not losing data. Some Somebody needs to be able to administer the platform. I need loose coupling of services. Something should be validating my data, all right? So an ESB is really meant to do a lot of things, okay? And again, not a new pattern, just, just more of a, you know, what did the industry do as a reaction to this problem initially? So some other ESBs probably heard of, we got things like Dell Boomi, uh, is popular on the, uh, on the commercial appliance side. Mule ESB, obviously we see a lot of Mule. Glassfish, not so much anymore. Tidco still ships a lot of hardware. Uh, Open ESB, I haven't really seen as much happening there. We got Service Mix too, which I should probably be mentioning here. Um, but is Camel an ESB? No, it is not. All right, Camel is not a full ESB. Uh, it can form a part of an ESB, uh, like we see in the Apache Service Mix product, right, where it's uh, combined with some other technologies that allow us to, to you know, kind of fill this full suite of expected uh, functionality or expected behavior. But on its own, no, it's not a full-fledged ESB, but it can form a, an essential part of an ESB. It's a standalone, normalized messaging framework, okay? Uh, and, and all of those words are very important. <laughs> um, normalization in CAMEL is probably one of the most powerful parts uh, of CAMEL in that, and, and you'll see this when we talk a little bit about the components, in that just about anything you're passing through CAMEL is going to have this nice abstract version of itself while it's in CAMEL that is very easy then to reflect, translate onto another client protocol to be able to speak to another framework. Um, so this normalization is very important to what CAMEL can do. Uh, beyond just routing, the normalization of data allows this flexibility to communicate with so many different endpoints, which we'll see. Uh, so it's an example of just one part of a message-oriented middleware system, which gives us routing, chore choreography, and, and other things, choreography, and, and other things like that. Um, message-oriented middleware is generally going to be a lot of different platforms kind of orchestrating together in concert, but CAMEL is not an ESP. So what is CAMEL? Well, um, once we had gotten past some of these patterns, ESB patterns, things like that, um, doing all this data routing and transformation across the enterprise uh, begins to kind of lend itself to a lot of what we would probably consider like boilerplate code, right? Repeat code, you've, you've seen this before. In, in, in text and publishing or in legal publishing, for instance, it's text that can just be reused, copied and placed and uh, reused in a lot of places. Boilerplate code is the same concept. So. You know, how many times have you as a developer working in some type of enterprise or, or mid-sized business application, you know, had a need to go in, open up a web server, or take a file and push it to an FTP site, or drop a message into a message broker, or, you know, these days drop it into something like Kafka, or maybe some big data solution, or go, you know, fire off some AWS process, right? I mean, you're writing, a lot of people are, have for a long time written code 
to do these things. And then you just, you know, copy and paste that code throughout various parts of your integration logic. Uh, you're often just writing different versions of the same thing over and over again. You're certainly not alone if you feel this way. And this is where this concept then of an enterprise integration pattern comes in. So um, Camel itself then is an open source message oriented middleware language, normalization framework, routing framework developed by Apache and based on enterprise integration patterns, which centers around this book, um, 60 common patterns that were found sort of in these enterprise integration patterns. The authors of this book um, were doing a lot of integration work in the uh, kind of early aughts. And they found kind of this phenomena that we're talking about right now. They would kind of go into a lot of these businesses. They would be solving the same problem, but solving that problem using a different, you know, different languages. Maybe, maybe one business is like a .NET shop and they write all this code and solve all these integration problems in .NET, but then none of that translates to what they can go and do uh, in like a Java shop or, or, you know, a shop that's running some other type of language or maybe a mainframe, you know, uh, organization. We don't really, we don't really know. Right. So they distilled and kind of boiled all of these different patterns that they found themselves uh, building into this sort of set of common code agnostic vendor neutral patterns that they called enterprise integration patterns. Now, often when I talk about Camel, I mean, I've given this talk several times. Um, I like to tell everybody in the audience, hey, you know, I don't keep a lot of technical reference books on my bookshelf anymore. Most of my reference stuff is digital now. I mean, things change so quickly, but I am not lying when I say that this really is a book that I have on my bookshelf. I do recommend it. You really can read it, you know, cover to cover. It's a great read. Uh, and it is very much the, the book that this language was based on. Now, it's this kind of merger uh, that makes Camel so great to work with as an integration framework of these patterns, these really nice vendor, as, vendor agnostic patterns that make sense for doing powerful integration with a syntax that takes a nod from the Unix pipeline, right? Which, which then makes Camel very approachable. So if I go and I, you know, ps-ef on my, on my command line, then I pipe that output into a grep statement, right? I've taken the output of that first uh, command and I've made that the input, I've taken the standard out and made it the input of the next command, right? That's what the Unix pipe operator does. Camel syntax takes a nod from that, except instead of sending, you know, between standard in, standard out, it says, okay, I'm gonna take this normalized message, I'm gonna do something with it, process, translate, hit a component, I don't know. And then after that, the message is going to probably be transformed in some way, and I'm gonna pass it through, you know, another, another, another component, almost just piping multiple commands together on the Unix pipeline. So it makes the syntax very approachable. That syntax ends up just being very elegant for dealing with pipelines of, uh, of message-oriented middleware. And the merger then of these standard patterns and this very easy to understand syntax and reduction of boilerplate is really what makes Camel such a, a, a powerful integration framework. And you'll hear a lot of that in this channel. I mean, I think, you know, once you've been a Camel user for a little while, it's tough to not be a Camel evangelist. Um, I mean, I'm probably 10 years into using this technology. Uh, my first major foray into it was eight-ish, nine-ish years ago, replacing close to 500,000 lines of Oracle BEA web logic with uh, Camel, some CXF, and ActiveMQ that was running basically in like service mix. And it, it was amazing to reduce that code set down the way we did. I mean, it was less than like 20,000 lines of configuration data by the time it was all said and done. But even, even still, you know, just, just hearing that last talk from Klaus and seeing what's happening with Camel K, I've been following that project as well. Um, you know, Camel is just continuing to, to impress and just be, you know, the way to do integration if you're going to do it with free software. So. Uh, you'll probably hear everybody evangelize it, but uh, I've got to get my I've got to get my uh, two cents in as well. Uh, notes on the project itself, maintained by the Apache Camel community, is top level uh, at camel.apache.org. Chief maintainer is Klaus Ibsen, who you just heard from, author of Camel in Action, uh, which I have the PDF copy of. I have to admit, I do not have. I, I have the Active MQ book. I think I do. Yeah, I've got the uh, I've got the Active MQ book here from from Bruce, but uh, not the. Uh, not the camel one, it, it moves too quickly, Klaus. <laughs> um, but I do have the PDF. Uh, as of, I just updated this today, the project has uh, almost uh, 700 distinct committers, 
spanning uh, 47,500 commits. Uh, and as you saw in that last graph from Klaus, a lot of that has been recent activity. Okay, so we've seen the activity really, really step up with some of these new projects, which is just great to see. Uh, it's written primarily in Java, contains some Scala, it's licensed under Apache 2, been folded into a lot of other projects like Mule ESB, old Mule to a degree, the Switchyard project, um, Service Mix, obviously, and Camel K now. Um, it can be run standalone, packaged in a war, deployed as an OSGI bundle, included as an active MQ set of VIPs, uh, deployed as we saw in Spring Boot, uh, deployed in uh, uh, in Camel K and Quarkus environments. So uh, really very flexible. Uh, two ver two types of syntax available to you: a POJO syntax if you're more comfortable with that. And there are you know some advantages to using it as well as a Spring DSL XML now also a Blueprint XML syntax. Uh, are made available to developers. I personally prefer this one. Uh, it's just, I don't know why. It, uh, it To me, it, it plays better with uh, some of the visualization stuff that you get out of like Hot.io, but plenty of people love this. And you know, I do some pros and cons in our training for Camel, but really you can't go wrong either way. It depends on what you prefer. All right, so what do some of these patterns, these integration patterns look like? Um, well, uh, things that are probably gonna be familiar to you even if you've never uh, necessarily seen them defined uh, this way before, right? Um, uh, so a content-based router, you, you've probably written something like this, even if you didn't know that it was called a content-based router. Um, but that's where this message is gonna route to disparate endpoints based on some message criteria. So this is the official EIP, EIP diagram for it. Uh, and basically this says, you know, if you're a green square, you go to the widget inventory, and if you're a orangey diamond, you go to the gadget inventory, right? And this router logic is gonna look at some characteristic of you and send you to the proper channel based on that, right? So again, routed to end endpoints based on some criteria of the message. So you've done this, right? If you've looked at, you know, you've gotten some data payload or somewhere, something from somewhere and you've had to look at it and say, okay, well, if, if this flag is set, I'm gonna send it over here. And if this flag is set, I'm gonna send it over here, right? So that's a content-based router. I can almost guarantee that you've all written something like this, a content enricher. Uh, this is where some basic message is going to enter into our pipeline or our message workflow. It's going to hit up some resource to take data from it and enrich our message with the data from that resource and then produce an enriched message, right? Fancy way of saying I'm going to start with something basic. I'm going to go hit up a database, go hit up a file system, go hit up a, a, a web service, whatever it is, and go pull something into my message. And now I have an enriched message, okay, content enricher pattern. Recipient list pattern. Um, your, your sort of broadcast pattern or multicast if you're broadcasting to everybody. So, you know, this is where I'm gonna take my message and then I'm going to get some predefined list of recipients and, uh, and send messages to all of those various channels based on what's defined. And if I'm happening to send it to all of the channels at once, I'm sending a multicast pattern then instead of a recipient list pattern. This, by the way, is one of the more elegantly uh, not that, you know, they're all pretty well implemented, but I, I really love the way that the recipient list pattern is, is, is implemented in Camel. I think it's just so elegant the way that, uh, uh, that the recipients are organized and, and it leads to a lot of easy dynamicism. So definitely recommend you take a look at how that's set up. Uh, here's kind of what's considered, you know, one of the more, maybe one of the most complicated uh, of the EIPs or EIP patterns, your scatter gather pattern. This is your typical, typical like, uh, you know, Expedia.com, Hotels.com, you know, we're sending a quote request out to a bunch of different vendors. Who knows what protocols are going to be running? Who knows what, what services we're going to have to try to hit? Who knows what payload formats we're going to get back? We're going to get the responses from each of these channels. We're going to assemble them into, we're going to aggregate them into a single quote and send it back. Now, you know, some of you may look at this and be like, I've written stuff like this. It took us like three months and there's a big team and there's like 100,000 lines of code. You can implement this pattern in Camel in like less than 100 lines of configuration and code. It is so good that way. I mean, the aggregation is incredibly elegant. The way that aggregation strategies work in pulling all of this data back and assembling it back together. Uh, the normalization, uh, the way that the components work, normalizing against all these channels makes it just so much easier to uh, separate from the data that you actually want to aggregate back in. This itself is super flexible because you have a number of strategies, everything from some, some baked in strategies that, that just make sense to getting super granular if you wanna use like a, a Java Bean to direct exactly how you're aggregating. So again, like this scary pattern <laughs> is actually made very, very simple 
uh, with respect for retries and exponential backup and all the asynchronous wonder stuff that we want from message-oriented middleware too uh, happening with you uh, in Camel. All right, so how does it work? Um, well, we kind of said before that, uh, just checking the time here. Okay, we're pretty good. Um, how does it work? Well, we use a repeatable normalized concatenation of processor and message objects uh, in a group called an exchange, all right? And really, uh, this exchange, although the next picture is gonna look, uh, some of you may call foul on it, let me explain that, that this exchange is one single object that exists throughout the, the workflow of the message, uh, even though it, it looks like they're kind of piped together like I'll show you, and that's just because of the, the syntax. That's just because of, again, coming back to this Unix pipeline um, uh, sort of uh, inspiration that was given to the syntax in Camel. So in general, then, we're gonna start with uh, some kind of input message, right? And again, this very generic, it's intentionally generic. This input message could be sourced from a lot of different places. Uh, that input message is going to go through some type of processor, right? Uh, that processor could be a lot of different things, as we'll see. And then if this processor happens to be a synchronous processor, so if we happen to be like hitting maybe an HTTP endpoint or something like that, where we're expecting a response from the endpoint, we'll have an out message. Right? Um, if not, if it's asynchronous, we won't have this out message. Okay? So this is what happens during a single exchange state uh, in, in a camel route. But remember, these states are like piped together like the Unix pipeline. So conceptually, I don't want, I don't want anyone to think that there's actually separate exchange objects here. These, these are just changing their state. Okay? But these, these, these uh, state changes uh, will pipe together. And in general, the output of one of these exchange states will become the input of the next exchange state. If there's an output message expected, like a synchronous hit, there'll be an output message created, and that'll get moved into the input of the next exchange state. If there is no output because it was synchronous, that's fine. The input message from here just becomes the input message to the next part along the, uh, along the exchange state. Okay, but again, I, it's a lot easier to explain how this works when you kind of think of them as being chained together, but they're not really. Just remember that the exchange object is just changing state in memory. So um, developing against Camel then, it doesn't really feel as much like traditional coding. I mean, you, you may go in and uh, you know change up some beans and things like that, and that definitely feels a little bit more like code. But when you're actually just you know wiring these components together, uh, it really feels more to me like kind of Tinker Toys and, and Lincoln Logs, if you will, right? We're taking well well-written components that work well together and we are sticking them together to form a pipeline of business logic. Uh, so components in Camel then work by creating these processors, and those processors do various things, various business functions. Uh, they can be chained together to build full integration patterns, though, then, uh, which are then these like bits of business workflow. So like if I had an FTP processor, for instance, um, that took in a message and initiated an FTP session, um, I might chain that up to an SMTP processor that then took that message and sent an email with it. Uh, and then, of course, I've got the EIPs that come with Camel as well, that whole palette of EIPs that are in the EIP book, so load balance, multicast, data sets, all that good stuff. And there really are just like a ton of components available to you. Uh, that's, again, one of, uh, one of Camel's big strengths. Um, so I just want to illustrate again, like, what I kind of meant by that is I could have an FTP processor here in this part of my state and it's literally just created a, what's called a polling consumer, or it's listening on a directory, an FTP directory, for some new file to pop in. And as soon as it pops in, Camel is going to normalize that file for me, convert it into a Camel message, so that I can then easily pass it over to the next part, maybe that SMTP server that we talked about, which is going to expect my message body to be the body of an email, maybe expect some flags on there to figure out who the email is going to, and then that pushes out. All right, So chaining those, those components together is very much the way that development is done in, in Camel. And again, tons of components, all right? <laughs> um, and this isn't even, I haven't, didn't take new screenshots for this one, a bunch of new ones that have popped in since then. I mean, some of these should look very familiar to you, though. You know, you've got a lot of different options in terms of what you can integrate with. Um, and, and again, you just get it. You know, if you Google Camel components, you'll see them all. And it really, they're just so pluggable. We have these great scripting languages too. This is not an exhaustive list, um, but kind of uh, in line to the way that you wire your components together, you can also take advantage of some of these familiar scripting languages to introspect um, 
to introspect parts of what's going on in the message and use that to make decisions in your workflow and whatnot. So simple, this is the one kind of most commonly used and it's a way to kind of query the message itself very easily. So the camel message itself, we can look at headers and payloads, properties, the body, uh, very useful uh, when uh, based on doing you know message routing when we do like for instance content based routing plenty of other things too if we want to you know pull parts of the message out and stick them in headers or properties or whatever we can do all that with simple uh, we'll see if we have time for a cool demo this is usually a one hour presentation but I'm trying to move through it quickly uh, if we have time for a cool demo we'll see uh, simple uh, in action XPath uh, is kind of similar to simple except instead of querying. Uh, the, the camel messages that we've been querying with simple, XPath lets us traverse XML structures. Okay, so we have, if we happen to be using XML payloads in our messaging, this makes it very easy to make decisions based on the content of that XML. JSON path, just like XPath, except we can do this with JSON. Uh, we can actually just drop a little Groovy script in there if we want to, if we want to do some more advanced infrastructure. And yes, you can even do entire processors in JavaScript uh, inline if you want to. Um, so again, we kind of said the syntax. Uh, we have a couple of options. We can do this uh, familiar Java Pojo, which uses what's called the Camel Route Builder class. It's what's called a Fluent Builder class, in that it's going to take this non-Java language, which is the Camel's configuration and Camel's uh, uh, fourth generation language. It is going to fluently interpret what this language is supposed to be, uh, and then it's going to turn that into Java objects behind the scenes in a very spring-like way uh, that, that do all the things you've configured as part of your camel route builder configuration, right? But you are writing, it feels a lot more like Pojo. Our demo uh, will use Blueprint XML. Um, you can also use Spring DSL XML. Uh, and you can kind of see that you have a similar syntax here. I mean, we always start with a from, we're starting with a from, this creates our producer. Anytime you have a new route in camel, you always have to start from some type of producer um, or, excuse me, some type of consumer. Uh, those consumers can be a lot of different things, though. I mean, in this case, we're like listening on an active MQ topic. Uh, in this case, we're listening on an active MQ queue. But that's not, you know, you could listen, you can have a timer that fires off on a specified amount of time that technically creates a consumer object when the timer fires off. You could be listening on a file system. You could be listening on an email address. You could be listening on an SQS. I mean, there's like, you know, so many things that you could plug into. Any of those components can become um, consumer objects here. So we have to start with that from, then we're gonna do some stuff. In this case, we're, we're making like a light uh, uh, transformation to our body. We're setting a new message body. Uh, and then um, finally taking that message body and sending it into a queue. Or in this case, we're sending it into a queue called bar. All right, so you know you can see that the same workflows can be created, just, just different syntax. Uh, deployment, again, uh, very flexible. Uh, we can deploy in a number of ways. Uh, we can deploy as a Java web app uh, using Spring or Pojo, standalone camel routes. We can use Spring Boot. We can embed within other Java applications if you just want to be able to create some of that. Um, if you want to just be able to create a little of that uh, integration logic running natively inside of your app, you can just embed it directly inside of your app. Uh, run it inside of a container like Tomcat, Wildfly, other things like that. Uh, ActiveMQ itself, the broker library, contains camel core. Uh, and can launch and deploy camel routes inside of it like our demo. Uh, don't abuse this. <laughs> don't turn ActiveMQ into like a full-fledged ESB. We've seen plenty of problems with uh, folks who, who have come to us with issues where you know they're, their ActiveMQ is like running out of memory and they don't understand why. We only have a few queues and we, we go in there and it's like they're running like 70 camel routes in there or something. So don't, don't do that if you really are going to deploy a lot of camel uh, use like a carafe container or use like Quarkus or Camel K, something like we just saw, uh, not, not inside of ActiveMQ. But this is great for very simple stuff, uh, simple routing inside of ActiveMQ and, and certainly very good for prototyping. Uh, and of course, uh, scaling very well to microservice containers like we just saw in Klaus's uh, presentation. Um, most IDEs uh, can kind of ease your development by allowing routes to execute within the IDE in, in various ways. Um, and as of 2.16, we have these really nice uh, comprehensive inline tools that are available, uh, which allows kind of auto completion and that kind of thing. Uh, Hot.io is still kind of my favorite way personally to prototype with Camel, uh, which we do have time for our demo. Uh, so, um, uh, so we'll jump into that and you'll have a chance to kind of see this. That allows for you know, visual debugging of routes and tracing and, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So we're gonna put together then a quick demo very simple content-based router. I'm, I'm going to build it by hand uh, from a 
from a clean install of ActiveMQ, just from scratch, um, just to kind of demonstrate that you really can um, get up and running with something valuable in a very short amount of time uh, using Camel. And then we'll uh, we'll observe that route in Hot IO, and then we should have time for questions. It should be a pretty quick uh, pretty quick demo. Uh, make sure I got everything pulled up. I think I do. So I promised that we would be starting from scratch. Make that a little bit bigger, just in case. And we will. Um, so I'm just gonna extract. This is just the one that I had happen to have downloaded. Make sure my job is looking okay. Um, so I am just extracting a clean version of ActiveMQ. And we're going to rename this maybe, uh, make sure we have an active. I think I already have an Apache Con demo in here. <laughs> uh, oh, no, sorry. That's for, uh, that's for my next presentation. Nothing to see there. Uh, so let's move this one then to, uh, I don't know, let's just call it. Um, active in queue, content-based router demo. Apache Con, why not? So again, fresh install of Active MQ. Now we said Active MQ ships with uh, Camel. That is true. Uh, you've got the libraries for it right in here. Again, you don't want to turn Active MQ into a full-fledged uh, ESB, but you can do some light prototyping. And for the purposes of, of demos, it's really handy. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, so ActiveMQ does ship with the example uh, camel route, which we can copy from our examples directory. And we're just going to move it into our comp directory. So that's kind of our step one. We are going to get rid of all this, make it a little bit more readable. We luckily don't have to paste in any of, any of our um, stuff we're going to be good and give our route an ID and this is where you know we're just gonna start um, running our route so we're gonna do a light um, uh, like we said content-based router to do that we need to start actually consuming from someplace so we're gonna say from URI equals active MQ and we'll say let's say um, uh, let's say CBR uh, demo why not so this will then create a consumer listening on this broker when we fire it up. Uh, and as, as soon as we start sending messages into this uh, queue, they're immediately going to just pop right into ActiveMQ already as camel messages in a normalized fashion. So we're going to make, we only have a couple of minutes, so we're just going to make really quick choices on here. So to do um, basic conditional logic in camel, uh, in this case content-based routing, we can use a choice block. We're going to have when. And Camel is, is so normalized that it doesn't really care what I put after this when, as long as whatever I put here returns a Boolean, right? It just, it doesn't really care what returns a Boolean as long as it gets a Boolean. So that's part of its nice normalization. So we're gonna use simple, like we said. And in this case, we'll just uh, introspect part of the headers. So we'll say, uh, let's say headers.jms type, it's just a standard JMS header equals, let's call it type one. We're going to send this message to, we'll create a producer a producer pattern now, URI equals active MQ. And let's call it type one Q. Okay. Maybe we'll give it one other condition. And we'll just say, uh, you know what? Let's just not, because we're running short on time and I want time for questions. Let's just do an otherwise, which means a catch all. And we'll say to URI equals active MQ unknown, let's just say. All right, so we've done some basic routing here. Now, I should be going through and putting in like, you know, IDs on all of these things. Uh, type one, catch. Unknown catch. This will all come back to when you go to start visualizing your route. It makes it a lot easier if you have these IDs in place. We also need to fix a tiny bug with the default uh, with the uh, example that ships with ActiveMQ. Just change that to what the broker is actually called, and that should be it. So we've got a very simple route here, calling it CBR demo. We're starting from this demo queue. We're making a choice based on the JMS type header that's getting sent into the broker, 
and then sending it to one of two destinations based on what we see in that header, okay? I'm gonna save it. Um, can't, ActiveMQ is very springy, it is spring, so all we have to do is import our camel resource as a spring resource. And with any luck, we should just be able to fire this up. What did we do? Oh, I misspelled a resource. I was going to say that. So. Thank you. <laughs> resource, looks good. Hmm. Now what did I do? Something, oh, camel contact didn't terminate. Oh, just because I've got two routes ending in here. So I do for doing these demos from scratch. Great, uh, so we have that route uh, started and it's loaded. If we just pull up our Hot.io app to visualize it, we can connect to our broker instance and we can see that we've got our camel plugin and we can look at our route diagram. And great, here's our choice block that we set up. Um, if we send a message through it, This is just our normal ActiveMQ console. You should see our new CBR demo queue, which we do. We'll set our type header to type one. We'll send it in. We can see that it was in queued and dequeued. We should probably see that, yeah, we've moved a message through here as well and it made it to our type one queue. So we can actually see that we've had one message go through this pipeline. Um, if we had time, I'd show you tracing, uh, but we've only got a few seconds left before the next session. So do you see that it, it came here? Um, I guess we can do our negative case as well. Uh, send this, and we're just gonna put gibberish in our type. Wonderful, and we have our unknown queue, and we can see that that pops up here in our unknown destination. So again, I know that it got a little tight near the end there, I apologize, but I will be available in the Camel Slack as well as the Open Logic Slack for questions. Uh, feel free to visit us there, thanks very much. Uh, I think we can do a couple of questions while uh, people move. Oh, so, great. For example, I, I see most of the questions, there, there has been a lot of questions in the chat, but they have been answered by Klaus and uh, Aurelien and other people, but for example, uh, Dan asked, uh, coming from the distributed systems world, working as a big data engineer, wondering if people are using Camel alongside frameworks like UCI, Airflow, Flink, etc. It seems to me like Camel does a lot of integration, but for smaller data. Do you agree with that? Or um, no, I mean I think that you know depending on the components that you're working with, it can be useful for larger uh, for larger objects as well. Um, I've seen it. I mean, I've seen like, so I've seen it in use in like Kubeflow setups before. It's been very useful for like passing training data from ground truth systems, um, uh, from, from ground truth systems that like, like mainframe systems and stuff and lifting that data up out of like maybe like a JT400 component or whatever, and then pushing it into maybe some type of cloud analytics engine that might be more related to like Airflow, Kubeflow, TensorFlow, you know, any of these things that you might be working with, Spark. Um, excellent integration between um, Spark and uh, and Ground Truth systems too. And well, there was a lot of questions, but they were already answered, and it's true. We out of time. Thank you so much for being here, and we will see you again later. Thanks so much, everybody. Take Bye. care.